very pleased to start with uh, our uh, second to last keynote uh, speaker, Hetri Kazo. Um, Hetri is an independent activist who studied criminology and environmental sciences, and she also has a PhD in, so in sociology. In addition, she is the author of uh, three websites, Has Fortels, August Vegan, and Crip Human Animal. And uh, today she'll be talking about Crip Human Animal on ab ableism, speciesism, and inclusiveness in the vegan movement. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for the introduction. And I also want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I'm very honored to be here and to speak in front of you. Um, I must say it felt a bit like coming home here, coming to this conference. I did my PhD in, uh, I started it in 1997, and I finished in 2002, so that was yeah, 20 years ago. And I really wish there was an organization back then, like the European Association for Critical Animal Studies, because I can tell you it was really lonely back then doing research into human animal studies. So it was very nice here, all the presentations, very inspiring. The two past two days have been really wonderful, and I'm sure the last day is going to be really wonderful as well. So. Um, um, I must say also, after seeing the program and who is on the program, I did start to get a little bit nervous. So, um, so I did my PhD a long time ago, um, uh, but I'm since long no longer in academia. So uh, I finished my, my research in 2002 that was on anthropocentrism and speciesism in criminology. And afterwards, I worked for a couple of years in youth care in an institution uh, where minor girls, girls from 12 to 18 years old, are placed by juvenile court. And then uh, I worked for a couple of years as a policy advisor for the Flemish government. Um, but my last day in office was around 2000 and uh, was in 2011, I think. So since a couple of years, I'm full time at home because I have chronic diseases. So I was diagnosed with several autoimmune diseases. That's nearly 30 years ago, but I worked full time till about 2007, 2008, but then my batteries really went, uh, went low. So uh, it's also only recently that I have picked up my interest again in critical animal studies and also in disability studies. So I'm exploring the connection between the two. I'm doing it at my own pace. Um, so um, my talk today, my presentation today is about my exploration into the connections between ableism and speciesism and in the second part of the presentation about points to take into account to become a more inclusive movement. So let's start with uh, a definition of ableism. What is ableism? Uh, one definition is discrimination or prejudice against disabled people in favor of those considered to be able-bodied. Another definition is the practices and dominant attitudes in society that devalue and limit the potential of persons with disabilities. It's a set of practices and beliefs that assign inferior value or worth to people who have developmental, emotional, physical, or psychiatric disabilities. So in the first definition, we see there those considered to be able-bodied. Um, so who is seen as able or who is considered as disabled? That isn't so straightforward. This is an example to make the point. Uh, on the left, we have a cow uh, with a prosthetic leg. That is Cow Hero. He, was, uh, he is now in a, in a sanctuary and a refuge. Um, and because of frostbite, he had part of his hind legs removed, amputated. So he has a prosthetics. Uh, in, the, in the traditional view, the cow on the left would be seen as a disabled cow. And on the right, we have the Belgian blue. Yes, the famous example from my country, I'm ashamed to say. And these cows, this is, has nothing to do with hormones or with, with um, cortisones or anything. This is how these cows are born. But that's because of natural selection for double muscling. So in a lot of cases, these Belgian blue cows cannot give birth naturally anymore and they need a cesarean section. And they also have joint problems because of the large body mass. And also, for example, the large tongue of the calves can cause drinking problems. But in the traditional view, the Belgian blues are not really considered disabled, while the cow on the left, uh, who has less uh, physical problems maybe, is considered disabled. So the definition of ableism talks about the discrimination of people with disabilities, but it did not say anything about who falls into the category of who is disabled and who is not. 
That is because um, disabled is actually the interaction um, between functional limitation on the one hand or impairment and on the other hand, an environment that does not take into account these differences or limitation and that creates barriers for, people's with an, for people with an impairment to live their lives fully. So on the one hand, we have the medical model of disability. So that was the dominant view on disability in the modern area uh, till the 70s, the medical model of disability. And disability was more seen as a personal tragedy, so disease and injury need to be cured uh, for the individual to become normal again. So the focus was really on the individual, the individual who needs to put in an effort, the individual who needs to adapt to society. Then on the other hand, uh, the social model of disability, which uh, was um, came uh, from the 70s onwards that says that disability is mainly caused by environmental and social barriers. So the focus is there not on the individual, but on society who needs to adapt. Society needs to provide accessible spaces and facilities. F you could, to, make a, uh, to give an example to make it more concrete, a wheelchair user isn't disabled because they use a wheelchair, but because society continues to build stairs, because society be continues to make buildings that are not accessible for people with disabilities. And it was also discussed about in the talk of Chloe Taylor, the universal design. If all buildings would be uh, universally accessible, yes, then, then if you take it to the extreme, there wouldn't be any disabled persons because they could access everything. Now, uh, without denying the real physical or psychological differences between uh, people and also the impact that impairment can have on their lives, so it's important to realize that disability ability is partly a social construction. And who is considered as disabled or able, that varies according to time, according to place, and also varies culturally, of course. Another example to make this more concrete, um, this is a, a detail of the painting, the fight be between Carnival and Lent from Peter Bruegel in the 16th century. So being disabled in the Middle Ages or, or earlier or later periods versus being disabled nowadays or being disabled in a region where there is healthcare and where there are uh, provisions for people with disabilities um, versus a country uh, devastated by war, that will be a totally different experience. Now, um, why am I talking about ableism or disability at a conference on critical animal studies? Uh, because I know many, uh, mo uh, some people perhaps will think that is a long stretch away from our focus on human-animal relations. And our movement is about tackling speciesism, of course, and about the fight for the animals. But uh, yeah, the first aspect is how we deal with each other as humans, how we organize ourselves as a society will of course have repercussions on how we deal with other animals. So it's like a matter of effectiveness. Um, if we make a whole group of people, so people with disabilities, not feel welcome in our movement or even actually uh, uh, actively discriminate against them, we're shutting out a whole group of people who would also come join our movement. So uh, people who would also fight for animal rights and tackle speciesism. Um, we are also marginalizing people who have disabilities, disabled vegans within our movement. So that's a matter of effectiveness on the one side. The larger our movement can become, the more efficiently or effectively we can fight speciesism and we can build bridges with other social justice movements. Um, but of course, it's not just a matter of effectiveness. For me, it's, it's a matter of justice, um, and justice is indivisible. You cannot take out just one as aspect. Uh, that's because all the different isms, like racism, sexism, speciesism, and also ableism, they are connected in a system of oppression. Now, these oppressions, uh, all these isms, uh, they are not only connected, and sometimes they intersect, but they also operate in the same way and they use the same tactics of objectification, animalization, devaluation for othering, uh, so people of color, women, animals, and also disabled people or persons with disabilities. So in a, in a Western way of thinking, in a colonialized or patriarchal view, um, 
the world is categorized in binaries or dualisms in which one end is always ha valued higher than the other. So for example, we have men against women or, or male against female and male viewed higher as female, human against other animals, white versus people of color, uh, rational versus emotional, rational valued higher than emotional and so forth as you see on the slide. And then belonging to a category on the left or on the right side means benefiting from privilege or respectively being in the oppressed group. And belonging to several oppressed groups at the same time, of course, adds other layers to the oppression. So disabled people are more at risk of being physically, sexually, psychologically and financially abused and also to be neglected. And that is then, of course, even more the case when they are women, when they are persons of color, when they are lesbian or gay, or when they are older or poor. And also, um, the categories in one slide also get linked together. So men are thought of as more rational uh, in this dominant view. Um, women are categorized as more emotional. Um, the, the people, the categories on the right are seen as closer to nature and more animal-like. So that also applies to disabled people. For example, calling disabled people animal names, seeing them as animals. So the animalization of disabled people, um, these are examples from uh, more in the 19th century, but uh, yeah, there are still lots of accounts of persons, people with disabilities who say that they are still called uh, animal names um, as an insult. The example on the left is from a woman who took part, uh, who took part in the so-called freak shows, who traveled in Europe and the United States, um, mainly in the 19th and also well into the 20th century. She was referred to as the baboon woman, the ape woman, the bear woman. She had a, con a condition that gave her uh, excessive hair growth all over her body. Another famous example uh, from the movie that was also made about it is um, The Elephant Man. So um, these freak shows uh, were in the same period and often took place together with the tours of animal menageries, so the zoos, and also the animal circuses which traveled with exotic animals across the United States and Europe. And in this period, and also well into the 20th century, we also have the, the so-called human zoos uh, who existed then, in which humans from colonized countries were also put on display. So that's more like an illustration of the interconnections between ableism, sexism, speciesism, and racism too. The following are examples of how the speciesist system also has health consequences for humans. So consider, for example, the impact of animal agroindustry on the environment, uh, which causes water pollution, air quality, uh, uh, bad air quality. The manure lagoons are a good example from um, mainly in the United States. You have that less in Europe uh, because of stricter environmental regulations. And all of these have in turn serious health implications for the people living in that, in, in that environment, of course. And it's also no coincidence that already marginalized and oppressed communities, for example, people of color, are often struck the most here because they are living in the vicinity. Also the development of resistant bacteria and also of viruses that can be life-threatening for humans um, and also especially being dangerous for people who are already immunosuppressed. Another example of overlapping oppressions is the psychological and physical toll on slaughterhouse workers. So the system depends on cheap labor, uh, labor and exploits not only animals, but also humans. Disabled animals not only uh, face speciesism, but also ableism. Um, for example, disabled animal companions have lesser chance of getting adopted. They face a much greater chance of being killed than younger and able-bodied animal companions because it is difficult to find adopters for them due to unknown veterinary costs. And I know there are a lot of movies doing the rounds on social media uh, which feature, feature disabled animals and I will get to the, uh, back to that later on in the presentation, but those are really uh, um, exceptions because most disabled animals do get killed. Uh, and a lot of disabled animals don't even show up in animal agriculture or slaughter statistics um, because most of them, a lot of them are immediately killed after birth or they are killed when getting disabilities or sick later on in life. 
or they are just neglected and left to die. Uh, for example, here on the farm floor, this is a photo of a disabled broiler chicken. You know, I, I don't have to explain this, their body mass is so big that m uh, their legs cannot carry the weight anymore. So this is not only the case for farmed animals that they don't show up in statistics and, and uh, have a greater chance of being killed, uh, but also f so for ex animal companions, as I already mentioned, they cost too much, they need too much care. For animals used in experiments, because disabled animals could distort the results, so they are of no use there. Also for animals in zoos and entertainment, because nobody wants to see a crippled lion and also for animals in the wild, because from an ecological point of view, injured or disabled wild animals are valued less if they cannot survive in the wild anymore. A point that I would like to know is that, um, note is that speciesism can in itself be seen as a form of ableism because it is discrimination of other animals because they do not possess, possess certain abilities. So, Throughout history, several abilities have been the demarcation line to give moral status to some and to deny it to others. So examples are being able to speak, being able to reason, eyes that face forward, walking on two legs. So of course this, this also had implications for the humans who do not possess those abilities. So humans who cannot speak, humans who cannot see, humans who cannot reason. They were, or in some cases, they are still seen as less human. So in, in some instances, uh, disabled people were also seen as the missing link between animals and humans for this reason. Um, I'm very much inspired by this book uh, by Sonora Taylor, Beasts of Burden, and for anyone who would like to read more about these overlapping uh, oppressions between ableism and speciesism, I, I very much recommend this book. And uh, that is also the reason why I started the platform Crip Humanimal. So um, it's my, my personal journey of exploration into the overlap, uh, overlap between ableism and speciesism. And I also want to give a platform to disabled vegans to tell their stories, how they face oppression uh, in, in general society, but also in our movement. So uh, human animal, that's obvious. That's the, the combination of human and other animals. And crip is the short for cripple that is actually used as an insult uh, towards people with disabilities or disabled person, but it's like um, a, re a re uh, retaking the word crip, reclaiming the word crip uh, to refer to, to disabled people. And it's also about uh, yeah, disabled animals. So yeah, take a look at, at the website, I would say, or at the Facebook page. Now, I talked a lot about uh, uh, similarities. Um, there are many similarities in the ways that different forms of discrimination operate, of course. Um, so the mechanisms that make that they are labeled as inferior are in many ways similar. And they are all connected in a system of oppression. But there are, of course, differences between ableism, speciesism, and the other uh, discriminations and oppressions. So for example, coming out or the concept of pride uh, can be totally different for disabled persons than, for example, for LGBTQ persons. And the experiences of the disabled people are not the same as those of women or people of color or lesbians or gay. That's a, a note I, I definitely wanted to add. Um, another point about institutionalized ableism. So these isms are often seen as individual prejudices, as individual discriminations or biases but they are in fact ideologies developed to enforce a system of oppression. So discriminating against disabled people is then portrayed by the system as the natural way of things. And the bodies and minds of disabled people are deemed not productive, not useful, not marketable. And it, that is seen as the natural way of things. Um, they are of no use in a system that is centered around production and profit. And they are also easy culprits if something goes wrong. They are blamed for economic and social challenges. Um, so ableism is al also often institutionalized. Uh, here are a couple of examples of institutionalized ableism. For example, the healthcare system or insurance. Um, 
many people are excluded on the basis of having pre-existing condition of certain abilities. Um, yeah, there are a lot of examples that I could give there. The administration that you have to go through to uh, require to get benefits benefits from the healthcare system, and I know that I, I'm very privileged in that respect because I live in Belgium and I live in a country with mono, one of the best healthcare systems in the world. But anyway, uh, it, it isn't perfect. I also have to go through a lot of um, a lot of administration. Um, so. The ugly laws, that's an example from in the 19th century and well into the 20th century, that was in the United States. Uh, in certain US cities, there were laws banning people who were deemed diseased, maimed, mutilated, or in any way deformed, so as to be an unsightly or disgusting object or improper person. So they were banned from public spaces. That was not really an aesthetic, that not really had an aesthetic reason, but it was really a means of controlling disabled people. So they had a, um, a, a way of, um, they had a, a reason to be able to arrest those people and to put them in institutions so they could be controlled. And for example, also then the, the forced sterilization of disabled people, eugenics. Also the killing of disabled people in, during the Holocaust. Uh, medical experiments on people with disabilities uh, still happening to this day in several countries. Uh, another example is um, government sponsoring charity events but not supporting independent living programs. So yeah, many examples of institutionalized uh, ableism. Now, uh, what is uh, the source of the system of oppression? Uh, for me, uh, yeah, it's a mixture of, of capitalism, of colonialism, uh, of patriarchy, a combination of all of these reinforcing one another. So for me, it's clear that activism should not only be about changing individual behavior, but about dismantling the system of oppression. So that includes being aware of the connections between the different isms. And that's why I, I talked about this uh, in the first part of my presentation. So tackling just one of these oppressions for example, speciesism, without taking into account all the other oppressions, and maybe perhaps also while colluding with the system, that will not work in my opinion. Now, um, the second part of the presentation is more concrete on how to be an inclusive movement. So, uh, is there ableism in the animal rights movement? Well, that's more of a rhetorical question. Uh, uh, I think there is, yeah. Um, that's also why I'm, I'm giving points to be an inclusive movement. Um, this is a quote from Carol Adams in an interview with Collectively Free. When we open a vegan brochure, we are most likely met with images of stereotypical, able-bodied, youthful, happy people who are also usually white and heteronormative. So, um, where is the diversity in the animal rights movement? And I consider this conference also, of course, part as the animal rights movement. It's maybe perhaps more academically orientated, but critical animal studies is for me also part of the animal rights movement. So, even if we look around here in this auditorium, do you see diversity? Do you see, uh, I don't think so, it, I see a very white, uh, audience in front of me, so that's already one aspect. And I know uh, uh, from, uh, I cannot really say from disability that people are underrepresented here because a lot of disability are not really visible. I will come back to that later. But, but from my uh, experiences, anecdotal, uh, that it is perhaps, I can say that they are not really represented in our movement. Before I go further, I must also say that my talk is very much inspired by my own personal experiences of living with uh, several autoimmune diseases for nearly 30 years now, and my involvement in animal rights and vegan activism for two decades. So my experiences are different than those of healthy disabled people, for example, people who, uh, who are deaf, blind, or paralyzed, that's a totally different experience. So my autoimmune diseases make that I have, um, I have pain and other physical issues, issues and mobility issues. Um, it also has a mental impact. I have difficulty concentrating and often have brain fog. Uh, 
and I'm also chron chronically tired. So uh, it's like my body is constantly trying to deal with, uh, with my diseases and that makes that I'm really tired all the time. And it's not just like tired, like you say, oh yeah, I did a city trip to Barcelona and I am going to take one day off perhaps and then I'm back on my feet again. Uh, but I'm, I'm really, even if I've slept 10 hours at night, I wake up in the morning and I'm tired. It's like a, a lead jacket that I carry, carry around with me everywhere. So, um, and, and an important note that I would like to make that I said before is that not all disabilities are visible. So uh, a lot of people with invisible diseases experience prejudice, disbelief, disbelief because they do not look ill. So that's a classic example. A person in a wheelchair is yeah, considered disabled, but people who don't use a wheelchair or who, or from whom you cannot see anything on the outside can also be disabled. Or a lot of prejudice as well, uh, because some people are supposedly too young to have a chronic disease like arth arthritis. And arthritis is not an old person's disease, but people who are 10, 15, 20 years can also uh, uh, be diagnosed with arthritis. So I, I experienced this myself too, the prejudice. The reactions to myself are totally different when I use my wheelchair, when it's visible, and when I don't. I don't use a wheelchair all, all the time. I only use it, for example, yeah, at the conference here because that too, that's too uh, uh, difficult for me. Um, but some, I can walk, I can uh, walk around, and then the reactions are totally different. Another point that I would like to know is that, uh, note is that my condition also fluctuates and that's the case for a lot of people with chronic illnesses and sometimes those fluctuations are even on a day-to-day -day basis. So one day I'm relatively fine, the next day I'm not. And you know, being chronically ill doesn't mean I spend all of my days in bed. I, I, I also work in the garden, I also go to a, a, a concert, I also do fun things, you know. Um, so chronic, having a chronic disease is not a constant level of feeling the same all the time. So that also leads to disbelief from people. So I get reactions like, oh, but you have a chronic disease, but you, you, uh, you cannot work anymore, but you can go to a conference in Barcelona. So the, so the, the disbelief, uh, but you can ride a bike. Uh, we have bought a tandem bicycle, for example, a couple of years. And I remember a reaction from a colleague uh, when I said we have bought a tandem and, oh, but you can do that. Um, uh, you can go to a concert, you can work in your garden. So uh, uh, what I post on social media are also only snapshots of my life. And to come back to institutionalized ableism, there's a proposal in the United States that um, that the department that deals with the applications of people to benefit from, uh, to have social benefits who are disabled, that they would also make use of what people post on social media. So uh, yeah, that's really ho horrible because to give you an example, it took several years before I felt comfortable ab uh, about having a picture of myself posted on my personal profile where my wheelchair was visible. I know that's a form of internalized ableism as well, but when you go to my social media profile, you wouldn't say that I was dealing with chronic illnesses for, for nearly 30 years. You know, it's only the happy stuff that I post here. I've been to a concert, I've been to Barcelona, but I don't post that I'm in bed and that I'm spending time in the clinic. And so that's only really, uh, so that, that would be a really, yeah, that's like a black mirror coming more concrete if that goes through in the United States. Another issue that I would like to note is the unpredictability uh, about uh, yeah, living with a chronic disease. It's very difficult for me to make a commitments, to make appointments, because yeah, it fluctuates from day to day. Uh, so that also makes it very hard to work in the traditional nine to five system. And that's why I was also really nervous to come here. Uh, not all, only because of the audience of academics mainly, but also because I, uh, yeah, I was really afraid that I was going to be too ill to deliver on the day uh, of my presentation. Um, so the unpredictability uh, I find very hard to deal with and to make commitments. The spoon theory was a, a term launched by Christine Misrandino, who is chronically ill herself, and she 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 launched that to explain to a friend who asked, "Yeah, but 
explain to me what is it like to, to live with a chronic disease? You say you are tired, but explain it to me. So at a, she was at a restaurant and she said, look, I'm going to take the spoons from this table and this table and this table. And she had two sets of spoons. And she said, look, we have 10 spoons here. Those are your spoons. And they, each of them represents an activity that you do during the day. For example, you get up, you shower, you have breakfast and you commute to your to work, that's one spoon that you take. And then you work, that's another spoon that you take for that activity. You go out for lunch and that's a spoon that you take. And maybe you, as a healthy person, at the end of the day, you have, you have maybe three or four spoons left or maybe even more. And then in the evening, you can go to a concert or a film or uh, go to the bar with your friends and then you go to bed and the next day you have 10 spoons again and you start a new day. But for people who are chronically ill, it means those 10 spoons, uh, you already need three or four spoons sometimes in the morning to prepare yourself to go somewhere. Sometimes even taking a shower can be exhausting that you have to sit down, uh, ha uh, taking, uh, preparing breakfast, uh, m making the kids ready for school. Uh, by, the, by the time it's 10 a.m. in the morning, your 10 spoons can already be ta all taken and you don't have any energy left for the rest of the day. And I also have to say being chronically ill also means spending a lot of time uh, for therapy, visiting the clinic, and waiting in waiting rooms for doctor's appointments. So uh, the spoon theory is one way of explaining this, and I like to explain it as, uh, as it is, is like living part-time. So they are the same hours and every day for everyone, but I can only use a portion of those hours compared to healthy people. Um, so related to this, the word spoonish, maybe some of you have heard this term, but it refers to the spoon theory that I just explained. That's a term that a lot of people who are chronically ill that uh, will use. The effect of social events on spoonies. Uh, you may already have not have a full battery when you start to get ready to go to an event. Even just traveling to the event can be too exhausting and just spending a couple of hours at, at an event can be really draining. So, so social interactions can be really draining. About internalized ableism, I already briefly mentioned this. Um, this is when people with disabilities themselves think they are of no value, that they are not good enough, that they think they have nothing to contribute or are redundant because the system makes them internalize ableism. Um, yeah, I have also uh, had internalized ableism. That was also the case for myself. So I said I was diagnosed 30 years ago. But for the first 20 years, uh, I hardly anyone around me knew. There were only a, a couple of co close, friend, uh, close friends who knew. Because also I knew what repercussions uh, opening up about my diseases when I was working in academia. I, I knew what kind of repercussions that could have for my work opportunities. And also because I wanted to be considered normal. And I could really... I could pass as being a healthy person. That's not possible for all people uh, with a disability, but I, I put in a lot of effort of, of appearing normal, of just passing, so that I realize now that was also a part of internalized ableism. Now I'm going to uh, give some points to take into consideration to become a more inclusive movement with respect to ableism. Listen to marginalized groups. So the approach of disabled people to veganism, their questions, their concerns might be totally different than those of able Bobby people. That's why I give a little bit insight in what it is like to be living with a chronic uh, illness. So if possible, let them be actively involved in campaigns targeting their peers. And if possible, let them lead those campaigns. So I say if possible, because for some people with some disabilities, disabilities that this might be more difficult. Don't say veganism is easy, because that's not true for everyone. It does not pay attention to the many oppressed or marginalized groups who do not have easy access to fresh food, to vegan products, and to vegan services. Think, for example, of people who are institutionalized, people who are in a care facility, people who spend a lot of time in hospital, or people who depend on others for living, for shopping, for food. Also, for example, people who depend on others or, uh, for, for ready-made meals. Um, people who need tube feeding. It's not so easy to find vegan uh, tube food. 
about activism. Uh, so stop shaming activists for not being present at rallies, demonstrations, or other events. Um, you know, activism comes in so many forms, and some forms of activism are just not mentally or physically possible or accessible for some people. Um, I feel in our movement there is so much focus on street activism, on people uh, doing the most visible forms of activism, and they are proclaimed the heroes of the movement. Uh, but there are so many invisible forms of activism too, and I also appreciate those forms of activism. Be aware that different types of activism appeal more or less to different people, and the time, place, and location will determine who you reach and who can come to your activities. Uh, stop the health shaming. No, I, I'm saying a couple of things about shaming, and um, I, I realize that Elisa Autola spoke about that in the first keynote, the first day. I don't think this is uh, uh, about moral shaming, but it's really identity shaming, so uh, uh, the, the type of shaming that can really have negative consequences for the people involved. So, for example, health shaming is shaming people about their health status. Um, veganism is very often presented as, uh, as like a miracle cure for all health problems, uh, like, oh, go vegan and all your health problems will be solved. And then if you are not healthy as a vegan, well, it must be your own fault, you know? You must be doing something wrong because if you would really follow a, a raw, whole foods, plant-based diet, you know, you wouldn't be dealing with these diseases or you would be cured. Now, there are so many other factors that determine one's health, not only diet, but also lifestyle, environmental factors. Think of air pollution, water pollution, radiation, genetics also play a part. Uh, and of, very often, there's not really a one-to-one -one link between any of those factors and health status. Now, I want to stress that I'm, I'm really not denying, of course, that a vegan diet and certainly a whole food plant-based diet is generally beneficial to one's health and that it can reduce the risk for many chronic conditions and illnesses. So yes, vegans are less likely to have type 2 diabetes, they are less likely to have hypertension or develop certain cancers. But it is no guarantee. Even vegans can get cancers, yes, and even vegans die. That's the title of a book by, uh, by Carol Adams, uh, Ginny Messina, and Patty Braidman. Um, um, so yeah, it, it's like it puts a lot of things uh, um, from the book, How Not to Die, from Michael Greger, that many of you probably will know. It puts a lot of those claims into perspective. Uh, yeah, and sometimes there's also damage because of a chronic, chronic or progressive disease that cannot be reversed with a vegan diet. If you, for example, had part of your bowels removed and you have a pouch, that bowel will, of course, not uh, miraculously grow back again. And if you have part of your bowels removed, you also have digestion problems and it's diff more difficult to uh, take in certain nutrients. So, yeah, there are many things that a vegan diet will not simply uh, or miraculously cure. So chronic health shaming has proven to work counterproductive, possibly leading to depression, weight gain, and also addiction. So it can actually make people's health worse rather than motivate them to live a better lifestyle. And I feel that this also contributes to the idea that chronically ill vegans are not good vegans, that they are not good enough to stand on the barricades for veganism. So if you don't fulfill the stereotypical image of beauty, of being young and healthy, you know, you could scare people away. Yeah? You, you are not really a good poster boy or girl for veganism. Um, this was one of the examples that I sometimes see on social media. So it says, non-vegan to vegan, uh, oh, my cardiologist told me I need to eat meat. And then the vegan replies to the non-vegans, I don't need a cardiologist. Um, no, I know this is meant as a joke and, and, and as a light way to point to the health benefits of a vegan diet. But uh, it, it really implies that we... There's an aspect in it, in it that, that implies that vegans are sort of, sort of invincible, that really we, we cannot get sick, we, we, we don't need a cardiologist. And one of the effects that this also could have is that people who follow, who come into veganism for health reasons, and they think, well, yeah, now uh, my health is, is okay. And if they have certain symptoms, they could think, oh, but, but I don't need to go to the doctor because, yeah, I, I'm eating raw vegan, I'm following a vegan diet, so I don't need to go to a doctor and the delay going to a doctor. But, you know, yeah, even vegans can get cancer, even vegans can get chronic diseases. So... Um, 
Another point uh, is medication shaming, um, the use of medication. So yes, some vegans do need to take medication. I take medication, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, I would like to refer to the definition of veganism there, um, as far as, as possible and practicable. practicable. And yes, of course, I'm against medical experiment on animals, let that be clear, just as I am against the unethical use of humans for medication testing. But we have to realize that all medical knowledge is based on unethical procedures and testing that has occurred on humans and animals. And we cannot undo that body of knowledge that has developed and that, uh, that helps to produce a medication and therapy. So, and also taking or not taking medication will in no way influence the demand uh, for animal testing as it is required by law for all medication. And as such, there are no alternatives uh, for medication as there are, there are alternative alternatives, for example, for cosmetics. So I would like to stress that instead of medication shaming, shaming vegans or other people for taking medication, focus on changing the legis legislation and on developing alternatives, not on shaming people who take medication. Yeah, the point I would wanted to make with uh, the pharmacy on the right is that it's not actually a pharmacy, it's a, a fruit and vegetable stall. A pharmacy is a place where actual medication is, is sold. About body shaming in, the, in our movement, well, I could really make a whole presentation about this, but I've been collecting images uh, for yeah, a, a couple of years now, and I could really give a 40-minute presentation about body shaming, unfortunately. So body shaming in the vegan movement or animal rights movement mostly comes down to fat shaming, shaming people for being fat. Yeah, but of course, vegans come in all sizes and shapes. Uh, and yes, on average, vegans do have a lower BMI, but that does not mean that all vegans are thin and that, no, not, uh, that all non-vegans are fat. And a vegan diet is also no guarantee for weight loss. And I have experienced this in myself as well. So because of my diseases, my weight has yo-yoed up the last 30 years in a span of just as many kilos. So 30 kilos, it goes up 10 and goes down 15. So I have experienced firsthand how reactions are different to a thin body and then opposed to having a fatter body. So my message here is please focus on the animal rights issue, not on singling out people because of their appearance. The, the, the example on the right is from the Santorini donkeys, and actually the photo of the woman on the donkey is, is not from in Santorini, Greece, but I believe it was uh, in Jordan, but it's a picture that is very often used when, it, uh, when actions or campaigns about the Santorini donkeys are launched. If you put a post, uh, photo out like that, you immediately focus on the fact that uh, oh, if we just have uh, fat people not riding the donkeys, then the problem would be solved. Then it becomes more of a welfareist issue instead of an animal rights issue. The, the, the message that we should bring out is donkeys shouldn't be ridden anyway, not by the body size of the people riding the donkeys doesn't matter. We just shouldn't be using them anyway. Um, other aspects are the conflicting message uh, concerning healthy food in the vegan movement. So on the one hand, uh, we are advertising veganism as a health message sometimes, and then the next day we are excited about the new vegan cheese and hamburger and hot dogs. And I must admit, yeah, I also do this. I have a couple of pages that I run on Facebook, and sometimes I will post about uh, the, the health benefits, because there are health benefits. But then the other day I post more fast food uh, type stuff. So yeah, that can be a very conflicting message and if you stress the health message too much people who come to veganism after a while they might say well I, where are the health benefits uh, because I don't notice any um, the pseudoscientific health advice I'm sure you are uh, familiar with some of these uh, um, advices for example that coconut oil cures everything and just a spoonful of turmeric a day will keep the doctor away so um, yeah, I, that's, I think that's really terrible. Um, 
Also, wishing bad health to non-vegans, the example on the right was from a woman who died during holiday in Greece after she had eaten uh, contaminated chicken, so she had food poisoning. And uh, yeah, the, the, the reactions that you see on social media that follow uh, examples like that, I find that really horrible. If her family and friends read those reactions, will they be inspired to come try veganism, to come join our movement? I think not. Um, how am I doing for time? So, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, about ableist language. Um, so uh, these are examples who are in Dutch, but uh, some words will uh, uh, be familiar because they are nearly the same in English. So you, using words like idiot, insane, lame, oh, he's so retarded, he looks like a loony, she's so autistic, crippled, spas. So using words associated with disability as an insult, as, as something bad. Um, and that's, those are a couple of screenshots on, on the one hand from, from vegans who are talking about people who have committed acts of animal abuse or animal use. But on the other hand, we also see such types of reactions from non-vegans, from let us say the, the other side, who are, also, who are referring to vegans as idiots or they're so schizophrenic, they're psychotic. They're so both sides do this, using ableist language, referring, uh, using those insults. But uh, actually people with disabilities are caught in the middle there. And there's a very interesting paper from uh, about that language use, ableist language use from both parties, and it's by Corrie Lee Wren and uh, other authors as well. I, I devoted a, a short post about that on Cripium Animal, if you want to find the reference. So alternatives for ableist language. Um, Instead of saying insane, crazy, psycho, stupid, dumb, and, and a whole other are listed there, use words like unreal, it's unbelievable, or oh, he's such a jerk, it's awful, it's bad, etc. Um, about microaggressions, they are like little jokes who are sometimes meant in a positive way, but can really can be hurtful to people with uh, disabilities. I sometimes refer to them as like uh, bites from a mosquito, although I, I don't know whether I should still make that comparison after being at a paper presentation of insects in media. Um, but I, I, yeah, I do find a mosquito bite annoying, and if you have 20 or 30 mosquito bites a day, it's certainly really annoying. And you can make the comparison with microaggressions, you know, if it's only just the occasional um, comment that you get, it's not, not so bad, but if you get the same ones day in, uh, day out, uh, it, it starts to get really annoying. So uh, an example of a microaggression would be like, I sometimes go to music concerts, and in some uh, venues, the accessibility is really good, and they really take care that people using a wheelchair will have a good spot in the auditorium. And this is, was a, a concert hall in the Netherlands, in the Boerderij, and uh, they have a separate spot on the balcony where the three or, three or four people with a wheelchair can take place. And we were there, and uh, suddenly a guy comes over um, and he looks at us, and we have, yeah, the first row on the balcony. It's, it's a nice view on the scene. And he says, well, they do get quite a VIP treatment, don't they? So that's really, that's, that's hurtful, you know? At, at a time like that, I don't really know what to say, although I, I would like to reply. But I would like to say, well, if you want to have this spot, you can take my wheelchair too, and I will go downstairs and be on the first row like I used to do 10, 15 years ago, you know? So those are sometimes uh, yeah, hurtful um, um, things that uh, microaggressions that also people yeah, of, of other marginalized groups and oppressed groups experience as well, of course. So the one on the left reads, oh, you have a mental disability, but you seem perfectly normal to me. Uh, this already implies that having a mental disability is, is that you are abnormal. Uh, and the ones on the right, I know they are too small to read, but this is some, somebody who wrote a lot of these microaggressions, who uses a wheelchair occasionally, so I kind of relate to a lot of those that she uh, posted there. These are a couple of other examples of mi microaggressions. So you don't look disabled, I talked about that earlier. 
uh, asking a person who uses a wheelchair, can you have sex? Okay, that was about microaggressions. About inspiration porn, so that was a term launched by disability activist Stella Young. So um, it's a portrayal of people with disabilities as, as inspirational, solely or in part on the basis of their disability. So this actually objectifies people with a disability, it reduces them to their disability. So it says here on the slide, inspiration porn is, uh, inspiration porn is nothing more than imagery and clickbait of disabled people overcoming and conforming to societal norms in order to inspire and motivate able-bodied readers. And the one on the right says, what's your excuse? Because that's uh, a term that is often used in such uh, disability in, um, inspiration porn memes uh, um, for objectifying me as your inspiration porn. Then it reads further. Um, think, for example, also of the videos of disabled animals doing the rounds on social media. So they are seen as cute, but often also as so inspiring. Um, as I said before, the number of stories of disabled animals pales in comparison to the number of disabled animals who do not end up in a cute video. So as I mentioned earlier, most dis disabled animals end up killed. And I often feel that such inspirational stories from disabled animals are more about making us feel good. They are used as inspiration porn and sometimes also have more to do with saviorism, centering the human savior than focus on the animals themselves really. One can also pose the question whether disabled animals are fetishized on social media. So yes, on the one hand, such videos provide a way for non-disabled people to talk about and engage with disability in an easy way. But on the other hand, they are used as inspiration porn, entailing the objectification of disabled bodies for the purpose of inspiring able-bodied people. And I must say, that's a screenshot of a post that I devoted to that issue on Cripium Animal. It's also remarkable that in vegan and animal rights spaces, that compassion and respect toward disabled animals often does not extend to disabled humans. Um, another example, I think you all know who this is, or rather was, that's uh, the cat who was commonly known as Grumpy Cat. Um, she recently died, but did you also, also know that she had a condition called feline dwarfism that was caused by a genetic mutation, which also entailed many health problems for her. And she was an internet celebrity and also a pet influencer, and her caretakers made an income of several millions of dollars, so it also raises questions about the exploitation of her disability, and also about the breeding of animals with special traits like uh, brachycephalic cats and dogs. So those are the, the cats and dogs with the really uh, flat face. So maybe that puts the cute memes of Grumpy Cat in another perspective. Um, if you want to read more about that, uh, Christopher Sebastian has just uh, wrote a short article about it, so you can read that on his blog. Um, I'm nearly finished, so I'm, I'm go nearly there. About being accessible, so most people immediately think about mobility accessibility, so the accessibility of events, demonstration, actions, meetings, but it's also about accessibility of your website, for example, so it's not just about wheelchair accessibility, but also uh, provide image descriptions uh, on the material that you put out uh, digitally, but also on paper, um, uh, subtitles, uh, transcripts, so the format of your media that you use. Be aware that not everyone can listen to a podcast, or can actually read blogs, uh, can see photos, so image descriptions are very important there. But just as important, I feel, when you organize an event or, um, or a demonstration, um, anything, or a festival, provide information about the accessibility of the event. So as an organizer, um, don't have the attitude, oh, yeah, we just, that maybe is too much effort to think about it now, and maybe there's just going to be one person in a wheelchair, and we're just going to wait and see if somebody asks, and then we'll think about how we can manage with that and how we're going to deal with that. No, please think about it in advance. Put the information uh, on your material, on your website, on your leaflets. Also, a person who can be contacted by several uh, uh, channels, phone, uh, via email, 
to have it as accessible uh, as possible for people with disabilities. You know, there's nothing as annoying as seeing an, an interesting event, a festival, a, a, a conference, and there's no information about accessibility. And I have to ask again and again and again, are there any steps? Is, the, uh, is it on the first floor? Is there an elevator? So that's really annoying. Just please put the information out there. Even if it is not accessible, just be honest and say, well, there's one step to get in. Then we know that. About being uh, inclusive, uh, so this is a slide to point to the non-representation in popular culture of disabled people. So there are hardly any disabled people in movies and magazines on television. And when they do uh, come into a movie, they are often played by an able-bodied actor. And also note that the villains or bad guys in movies are often uh, have visible disabilities, for example, the one-eyed or one-legged pirate. But about inclusiveness, uh, it's more than just diversity, of course. It's not because some persons with a disability participate in an event or are a member of an organization that the event or organization is truly diverse or inclusive. So don't use people with disabilities as tokens in campaigns. And I'm going, this is the last slide, I'm going to round up now. Um, this goes back to the first part of my presentation. I would like to, uh, to end with a very fitting and well-known quote from Audre Lorde. She was a black feminist writer and feminist activist. And I know she didn't specifically address speciesism, but I feel this quote is very appro appropriate here as it underlines the interconnectedness of all oppressions. So it goes like this. Um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat them at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. So racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, and other forms of oppression and discrimination are the master's tools. And so is speciesism, of course. And if we want to bring down the speciesist house, we cannot do so by using oppressive tools of discrimination based on age, gender, race, sexual orientation, or abilities. And I feel it's high time that our movement does some introspection on all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gertrude. Um, We've quite run out of time, but I'm sure that we can accommodate at least one question. There's a question over there. Yeah. website and I want it to be more inclusive but then um, I I don't know I don't want to like be that person that's just like putting up pictures of like people from marginalized backgrounds and using that um, for my own benefit so where do you what like where do you draw the line between like what's tokenizing and what's inclusion yeah yeah that's a very difficult issue of course mm -hmm. I think uh, the the fact that you are really inclusive as an organization, as an organizer or of an event, will already be visible from the other aspects from, your, uh, from the event that you organize. Um, and if you then use people of um, marginalized communities in photos and pictures, that won't be tokenizing because it is already visible and, and it already is portrayed in the working of your organization. But I, I realize that indeed it is a very uh, thorny issue. Where do you, where is it tokenizing? Um, and sometimes I also deal with that myself, you know. Uh, am I tokenized uh, in being part at certain events and being uh, given a platform to speak, do they only do this because I use a wheelchair or because I'm, you know, uh, that's a very difficult issue. Where do you draw the line? Mm -hmm. I cannot really say any more to that. Thank you. Thank you then. We close the session. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.